Hello and welcome to episode 2 from series 6 of The John McNair Show. Today I talk with playwright Dr Louise Helfgott, who has recently written a play on anorexia titled Frames. Dr Helfgott is the sister of celebrated classical pianist David Helfgott, who is portrayed by Geoffrey Rush in the 1997 movie Shine. For his portrayal, Rush received the Oscar for Best Actor. Dr Helfgott's play aims to raise awareness of a condition which is becoming more prevalent in society. Hello, Louise. Yes. Yes, it's John. I'm ready with the questions. So what inspired you to write Frames? Um, 
I, I was inspired to write frames by an incident that happened in my family. One of my relatives developed anorexia and when her family could no longer cope with looking after her, um, she came to stay with us for a couple of months. And the experience of looking after her and seeing what the disorder had done to her life provided the initial inspiration. I was then offered a scholarship to do my PhD in writing at both Edith Cowan University and Murdoch University. When I chose to do my PhD at Edith Cowan, um, the topic that felt right for me to do was something on anorexia. I felt right, um, ready to write the play and I now had the context in which I could do the research to back up my play and, um, and put it down on paper. I was wondering about the um, statistics regarding anorexia. Um, are you au fait with, with the West Australian statistics or global statistics? Yes, I've done a lot of research in this area and about 1%, about, actually it's, um, in Australia it's about 2% of the um, um, female population develop anorexia and it's about 1% of the male population. But the, the statistics are, are constantly changing as well and it's hard to get um, global figures because you know, from country to country it will be different. There's... <clears throat> A lot of um, I did a lot of research in the lead up to the in in the lead up to the play, but I actually wrote the play at the beginning of my PhD, and then did a lot of research afterwards as well to validate what I had written and to ensure its authenticity. I also interviewed a number of field um, professionals in the field, and this helped fill out my understanding um, of treatments used as well as some of the factors leading, you know, causative factors leading up to someone developing this condition. So there is also a, obviously a community aspect to this play and you want to make people aware of uh, body perception, self-image and anorexia, I gather, which is probably the main reason you've, you put on the play. Uh, do you hope to promote discussion about anorexia? Absolutely. Um, after so, um, some of the performances of the play, um, we're holding panel discussions or open discussions and we're inviting experts from the mental health field as well as some of the cast. I'm also hoping to have a couple of young people who are in the process of recovery or have recovered from an eating disorder. Great idea. To be on, yeah, um, to be on the panel. And um, we're going to encourage the audiences to ask questions from them, of them, and, and generally to find out, you know, to have some of their confusion answered, some of the, um, their questions answered. With, um, with the panel, with the open discussions as well, we, um, we've, we've, we've chosen certain matinees and certain performances. So we're having, we're having open discussions after two of the school matinees in Mandra because there's been overwhelming interest from the community um, asking for something like this to take place. So we've um, organised, we've got one school matinee in Mandra that's completely booked out and the other one is just about booked out. And so we've chosen those two performances to have a, an open discussion. We're also going to have an open discussion after the opening night in Subiaco and after the opening night in Mandra as well so that the general public can ask questions. What we're trying to do is... Um, make it more comfortable for people to talk about an issue or topic that is often too difficult or uncomfortable for them to raise in general conversation. It sounds like it's an all-ages affair. Absolutely. 
although the main character of the play is a young woman of about 16 or 17, anorexia actually afflicts um, a wide um, demographic of the population. And I, I wrote the play with families in mind, so I've written it really for all ages. I, and I anticipate that, um, pe- that families would get something out of it. Young people, I think it's, it's pitched um, to, um, to attract young people as well, but there's a lot of material in the play that would be of more interest, I suppose, to older people as well to help them give a better understanding of what anorexia is about. So would it be safe for a parent to take their 11-year-old child to see the play? I think the age that it's really pitched from is um, from about 12 onwards. 11 is probably okay as well, but we're encouraging audiences from about age 12 onwards. Although I did notice that on the Ticketek site, it does say that um, from age 10 and above. So, yes, I'm sure that an 11-year-old would be fine. Okay. That's important um, because I know a lot of people who would be interested in coming along and getting their kids to come along. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I I think that um, it would be of relevance and of interest to young people from about age 11, age 12, as I was saying. I, I don't know that they would fully understand some of the symbolism in the play, but that's where the symbolism becomes more appropriate and more interesting to an older age group as well. So I think there's a lot of diverse elements in the play that would appeal to diverse audiences. Excellent. I wanted to ask you if you are coming from any particular religious or political angle uh, in writing this play. I don't think I'm coming from any religious um, angle, um, although I am trying to make some kind of point in the play about how society has come to focus much more on appearance and in in so doing, on, on appearance and materialism, and in so doing has lost its spiritual heart. Um, but that's not from any particular religious framework, but more from an overall context or um, philosophical context on what you know modern Western society values. Yes. Um, as far as a, um, from a political point of view, I I think the play has political ramifications in terms of where money should, where resources should be going, and in terms of what um, depictions should be discouraged or, in fact, stopped, um, mediated and prevented in the media. So I think the, um, the media depiction of um, the blend ideal where women are encouraged to, you know, to, to be very thin um, has political ramifications because it's it, um, images like this which help to encourage anorexia, which facilitate the development of anorexia. And so the, politi- the political consequence of it is that um, we should be looking at what we're showing our young children, at what media depictions are being presented and um, the effects that they might have on not just young girls, but on young boys as well. Because, um, you know, an increasing number of young boys are also becoming very image conscious. So in terms of where what I'm trying to show in the play, I've, I've chosen a very, um, an, a very overall and generic approach. <clears throat> I look at psychological factors. Um, I look at sociological factors. I look at philosophical factors. In fact, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of different discourses that have um, contributed to the development of this disorder in our society. Very good. 
I'm, and my, the approach that I wanted to take was as broad as possible because what I wanted to look at was some of the factors, some of the causative factors that contribute to the development of this condition. I present one particular scenario in the play, although there's lots of scenarios that can lead to a condition like this. I've chosen one particular one that I have found to be relevant. And, and in that scenario, I, I consider lots of different factors that are happening in this young woman's life that have caused her to develop you know, this um, terrible and debilitating condition. Uh, so this is like an overriding influence. Yes, that's right. That's right. Very much so. That's but important. When I set out to write the play, I didn't come to the play thinking, um, you know, what am I political? You know, what's my, what am I trying to do on a political level or sure. on another level? But in considering, the, you know, the conditions that lead up to someone developing anorexia, it was of necessity to look at you know, some of the socio-cultural factors um, that are prevalent in modern Western society that have led to the development of this disorder. For sure. Yeah. And for me, it was a very important play to write because, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if many people are aware, but um, about 20% of people who de develop anorexia die from the condition. So, I mean, this is, you know, a huge, morbid, very high morbidity rate. It's the highest morbidity rate out of all mental illnesses. I didn't know so, that. Yeah. So it's, it is a very, very important condition that needs to be looked at, and there's not very many um, plays that have been written about it. There's been quite a few narratives and lots of books, but there's been very few plays. So I felt that in writing a play, I was... Um, you know, able to show, able to depict, as I said, a scenario that was relevant and appropriate and would help people understand better, as well as being entertaining. I mean, you know, if you're writing a play, it also has to have that value. But it, for me, it also had to have a, a slight, you know, educative value, I guess. Right. Um, and left people thinking and left people discussing the issue. Well, you always seem to have displayed a good social conscience in your works. I'm speaking about the short play, The Body, yeah. um, which I really enjoyed, um, which was basically pointing the finger at how we um, judge people according to socioeconomic status and how we bypass people who don't concern us. And I think, in a way, this is another example of your social conscience on display um, basically getting community involved, trying to make a situation better or heal, heal an illness um, through community involvement and raising awareness. So th this is a theme that seems to run through your work, uh, Louise. Absolutely. Yes, that's very, very true. Um, a lot of the plays that I've written, and in fact a lot of the poetry I've written and a lot of the stories that I've written, um, but especially, I think, in the plays that I've written over the last few years, I've looked at something that means, for me, means something, something that I want to show, something that I feel is unjust or that we need to improve in our society. I'm usually motivated to write when I feel that what I'm writing about um, is important enough, you know, is, in, is important to write about. So that's yep. one of the underlying factors that motivates me to write. And um, I wrote a musical called The Bridge. Yes, which... I've, I've heard the music from The Bridge. Excellent. Thank you. And um, so that dealt with youth homelessness. And um, we staged that on two occasions, actually. On the second occasion, we had a, a tour of the Southwest as well with it. The, um, the Bridge actually went on to be a finalist in New Musicals Australia in 2011. And so I looked at very, you know, I looked at some of the factors that lead up to youth homelessness and we ran a community project as part of it. So we ran workshops for young people who are at risk and we tried to encourage young people who are at risk to be involved in the production and to participate in some way, in some form. 
And I another of the play that another play that I wrote um, and, and was nominated for an Augie Award in two thousand and five was A Closer Sky, yeah. which um, looks at um, Aborig- Aboriginal issues. Um, I was actually asked to write it by the Peel Aboriginal community. Which which community is it? The Peel Aboriginal oh, community. Peel, yeah. So the Aboriginal community of Mandra and its surrounding um, areas. And um, in A Closer Sky, I look, I, I, I follow a young woman's life from, you know, leaving school through to, um, you know, raising a family and some of the issues and problems that she encounters along the way, um, including um, racism, um, including difficulties in finding accommodation and employment because she's Aboriginal um, and various other problems. So for me, that was something that needed to be written and um, I wouldn't have, re- you know, wrote it. I wouldn't have um, yeah, written it unless I was actually asked by the Aboriginal community. So did you so, cover Aboriginal spirituality with that play? A little, a, a little. I have scenes in the play where the voices of um, the Dreamtime um come to her, um, they, they, they remind her of her heritage and yeah, so, but I've done it in a, in a more subtle way. So <clears throat> the actual play itself looks at, you know, her life and it looks at all the factors that, you know, and her sense of not belonging in the broader community and her sense of trying to find her identity. So... I guess you could also say it does look at her, her spiritual well-being because um, someone's quest for their identity is part of their spiritual quest, isn't it? I would say so, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to uh, get some feedback on who your main artistic influences are in the in the playwright world, shall we call it? Um. Okay, main influences. Well, as a young girl, I started writing plays when I was about 13 years old. And um, I didn't have a lot of influences when I first started, which was good because it gave me the opportunity to develop my own style. Um, Then in my late teens, I started reading Shakespeare. So Shakespeare was an obvious um, and very strong influence. Um, because I love a lot of his plays, and Hamlet is one of my favourites. And um, other playwrights since then, Eugene O'Neill, um, who wrote A Long Day's Journey Into Night, um, was, one of my, was one of the writers who inspired me a lot. I love Chekhov. Um, I love Ibsen in Australia. One of the writers that influenced me was Louis Naura. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, yeah, I like David Williamson in a different way. So, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of playwrights, I suppose, that I admire and look up to. Um, in terms of what's influenced my writing, I don't know that I could really answer that. I think that because I had already started developing a style before I read or saw a lot of theatre, I... Um, was less perhaps influenced by what I then saw later, except I I am now probably experimenting a little bit more in the style, in the styles that I'm using in writing. And I certainly noticed that in doing some of the research for my PhD, I had new, I had ideas about uh, including other aspects of Elizabeth's character. So the main character is called Elizabeth, but Elizabeth has different persona in the play. Um, she has, you know, in one persona, she is Lizzie, who is the, you know, the child in, in her family. So that's the family perception or, or frame of seeing her. She's also Eliza um, to her friends. So that's her, the peer group frame seeing her and so I have other persona but then in, in doing my research 
I developed another persona, which was Elisabetta. And Elisabetta was inspired by St. Catherine of Siena, um, a medieval saint who used to starve herself in order to achieve spiritual salvation. And um, some, so some of the research that I read drew parallels between modern anorexic behavior and the behavior of medieval saints. And I found that a particularly compelling image, and so I then included it. So that's an influence, but it's not, it's not an influence from another writer, but it was certainly an influence in terms of the research that I had read. I wonder if you came across Therese Newman, who used to eat one host a day for many years, and I guess she was pretty anorexic looking. Um, I think that, yeah, that does ring a bell. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, that came up in one of the books I was reading. Mm. But um, I went with the image of St. Catherine of Siena because, it's you know, yeah, yeah her, her, um, um, her asceticism was of such an extreme nature that it just was compelling. It was, you know, I just felt I needed an image that was very, very strong to suggest how self-punishing an eating disorder can be. And okay. for me, that was the image that captured my imagination and seemed to encapsulate the modern, the modern suffering, the, the suffering that um, modern-day anorexics inflict on their body and on their soul. Mm. So how much time do you spend communicating your ideas for the play to the actors? Um... Well, so far, a lot, not a lot. Um, I've spoken a little bit to the, the main lead actor, but I imagine as rehearsals progress, there will be more discussion and um, and perhaps some alterations and amendments made to the script. Um, I very much want the script to stay in touch with how you know teenagers speak, the lingo of, of teenagers, and that's constantly changing. So I imagine that there will be um, a few alterations to words or phrases and perhaps, you know, to sections of the play as rehearsals progress. I'm very open to that and, um, you know, I'm very happy to respond to feedback given to me by the actors. Do you have to feel comfortable that the actors get it, that they are absorbing the, the, the persona? That, um, that you've written about, that you've created? Do you have to feel that they embody those those personae or are you happy for them to interpret the characters as they wish? I think it's a combination of both. I think that um, I would like them to understand my interpretation of what I'm trying to present in the, in the personae of Elizabeth, but I'm also happy for them to use their imagination and have their interpretation to some extent. And I think that as Elizabeth, the main character, is the only one in the play who presents different personae. And as we have an outstanding young woman, um, young actor, to, to perform her, my feeling so far is that she does understand it um, and that she will... No, you know, she will understand my um, vision for the for the character, and also add her interpretation. So you didn't completely handpick the actors. I wasn't involved in the selection of the actors. That was the director's domain. Okay. So, but um, I was I I did attend auditions, although I didn't fit into the actual auditioning process. I was just helping, and um, I. Um, attended a workshop that we ran for young people as well. So we gave a free drama workshop that was held at a studio in Wapa on the 9th of March and we encouraged um, a lot of young people to attend the workshop and we we also, you know, taught them various techniques in the workshop to do with character um, development and monologues. And this would have given them an advantage in auditioning for the play. So I was actually at the workshop. And some of the people who attended the workshop then obtained roles. So I had seen some of their work before. Although I didn't have a, um, a hand in, in picking the actors, 
I agree with the director's decision and I was very happy with who she has selected. Good. I'd like to move uh, back to anorexia and ask you about uh, the quality of service which is available and um, and success rate. I think anorexia is a very difficult disorder to treat and a number of different treatments have been used. I think that... Um, I think that the service and the treatment that is provided um, has definitely improved over the last few years, although there has been some articles in newspapers which still indicate that there's still a long way to go. One recent article that I read was that they were cutting back beds in Sir Charles Gardner Hospital and they were cutting back beds in the anorexia ward, which is, you know, I I was um, very concerned to read that. Because I think that, um, you know, anorexia is on the increase and, um, you know, we need to be providing more resources into its treatment. But I do think the quality and the um, types of treatments that are being used have improved over the last few years. They've even improved, I think, since my relative was receiving treatment. I wouldn't. I don't feel in a position to comment on the efficacy of any particular kind of treatment. Um, my approach in research and my approach in writing the play, um, as I said earlier, was on the cause of the factors. Although, um, you know, I, when I did field research and I interviewed a number of professionals, I interviewed um, psychologists, clinical psychologists who were working in the field who were using different types of treatment. And um, one of the treatments that's being used in um, at the uh, Westmead Hospital, for example, which is one of the main hospitals in Sydney that um, has an eating disorder clinic, um, one of their main treatments is based on the Maudsley method where, you know, they're um, they're, they're basically treating the, you know, the eating disorder. They're, tra- they're treating the behaviour of the anorexic as well, and working out and trying to try different methods to, um, you know, get uh, to encourage the anorexic to eat again. So when is the play on, Louise? Right. Okay. And where? Well, Okay, it, the play is on at the Subiaco Arts Centre from the 21st to the 31st of May and at the Mandra Performing Arts Centre from the 4th to the 7th of June. Evening performances, um, but we also have some matinees. We have a matinee on Saturday the 31st of May and we have a couple of school matinees that are um, at Subiaco on the 23rd and 27th of May and in Mandra on the 5th and the 6th of June. That's pretty good uh, exposure for the play. Yes, yeah, it is. It's great. Yeah, it's a good season, a good well, run for it. Well, Class video. Act Theatre are putting on the play and Class Act Theatre um, do a lot of work in theatre and education, so they do encourage a lot of the schools to attend. And I'm happy with this because I'm happy if the message of the play does reach a lot of young people because a lot of young people, um, you know, are at risk of developing an eating disorder. So for me, it's very relevant and important that the play reaches, you know, the people that it's directed to. Mission Australia did um, research, did a survey on 50,000 young people And the research was published in 2010 and the research found that out of the 50,000 people surveyed, the number one concern for young people today in Australia is body image. So uh, to me, you know, reaching young people is what this play is all about. It's highly relevant. Well, uh, congratulations on taking up this difficult to discuss topic and um, helping helping people to treat it, um, raise awareness and um, basically see if we can alleviate the suffering 
of thank you of these people. thank you i think yeah. it's certainly not out of character for you given your no. background <laughs> yes <laughs> that's and, true yeah i think it's great do you have any final words you'd like to share with the the listeners um only that um i want to also you know stress that the even though I'm writing about a serious issue, the play also presents a lot of hope and um, and does contain humour. So I don't want to, you know, make the play sound like it's all about serious issues. I, you know, I, I've been concluded a number of scenes which, you know, would elicit, you know, um, humour in the audience as well. So, and I, I try, um, you know, sometimes I try and take a I'm using diverse methods to to show something, but I use me- methods which will also entertain the audience. So I did want to stress that even though it's a serious issue, I don't think audiences will come away, um, you know, feeling too gloomy or too depressed or anything like that. I hope that it gives them a sense that, you know, there's um, ways of dealing with the with it and um, and that there's hope. The yeah, without giving too much away, I, I think that the play does present some uh, a hopeful ending. Great, I'm looking forward to seeing it, and I'm bringing someone with me. Great, so, <laughs> thank great. you. Uh, thank like you to, very much. I'd like to thank you very much for your time, Louise. I really appreciate it and. Let's go and see the play and Thank enjoy you. it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the interview, John. No Thank worries. You. Thank you, Louise. Okay. Bye for now. Bye for now.